But what I discovered was that for all the snarling and all the shouting and all the waving of my fist, I was simply entertainment for, a basic, uh, for basically a wide audience. And uh, that almost destroyed me to think that, you know, I was sort of a circus act almost. And so I said, okay, I've got I've to stop that and I've got to figure out some way to talk about these very serious issues. And what I discovered was that people were willing to listen to you if they thought you were friendly. And so I pretended to be friendly. <laughs> To the Harbor Grace excursion with the most to have. Books really saved my life. I'll just read the sort of first part of this, the intro, the opening chapter, and then if you buy the book, you don't have to read it yourself. <laughs> unless you want to. <laughs> Bob Tatum wheeled his suitcase from the baggage area to the car rental desk and tried to work the stiffness out of, the, of, of his back and his legs. The flight from Seattle to Great Falls had been on time, but the commuter from Great Falls to Chinook had developed a mechanical problem and had sat on the tarmac for almost five hours, always a crowd pleaser. He had wound up next to a bony blonde with a collection of shopping bags which she arranged around her seat like party pillows. Tatum had tried to ignore her. He rolled up against the window, his neck bent at an awkward angle while the woman opened packages, removed cellophane, and pulled tape off designer boxes. In the confines of the small plane, it sounded as though she were rip ripping tin off a roof. And, and the sandwich. The flight attendant had called it a ham and cheese on a French roll. Tatum had never been to France, and he was reasonably sure that the roll hadn't either. <laughs> a little lettuce would have been nice, maybe a slice of tomato. There wasn't any, even any mustard or ketchup to set an edge and brighten the taste. The sandwich had been the size of a small log, and each time he tried to take a bite, a glop of thick white goo had squeezed its way out of the sides of the bun. It wasn't mayonnaise, he was sure of that. <laughs> the young man at the car rental desk had a gold badge that said, Orem. I have a reservation, Tatum. Mr. Tatum, said Orem, looking at the computer. Seattle, right? I reserved a compact. Orem glanced at the computer. It's your lucky day, Mr. Tatum. We'd like to upgrade you. How does that sound? Rental upgrades along with airline food delayed flights and irritating passengers were just another of the many minor annoyances of travel. In his years of moving around the country, Tatum had only gotten a compact car once. <laughs> Every other time he had been upgraded, which was the expression the re car rental companies used to make you feel as though you had won something, as though getting a larger, clumsier gas guzzler was first prize in a lottery. I reserved a compact. Well, unfortunately, we're out of compacts at the moment, but there won't be any additional charge for the Suburban. <laughs> Tatum set his bags down, closed his eyes. Do you have anything else? It's very comfortable, and it has a sunroof. Something smaller? Orem looked slightly hurt, as though Tatum had just told him that they couldn't be friends anymore. Well, there's a Jeep Cherokee. It's sort of a compact. <laughs> Regional airports had the advantage of having everything within walking distance and the disadvantage of having a not having a shuttle to take you and your bags from the terminal to the parking lot when you were worn out and grumpy. The night air was cool. Tatum dragged his bags towards the cars and wondered once again if life would have been different if he, if he had finished university. His major for the first three years had been sociology, but then Kathleen had come along, complete with a job in her father's company. At the time, the job had looked good. Kathleen had looked good, too. <laughs> the rental cars were lined up like horses at a hitching post with not a compact among them. The black suburban was more elephant than horse. If he'd had his way, he'd drive a sports car, something agile and quick, but sports cars didn't seat a wife, three kids, and a six-figure mortgage all that well. 
Maybe when he retired and the kids left home, he'd get a used Jaguar, or, or better yet, a Corvette, an older model with red and white tuck and roll upholstery. There were two Jeeps parked next to each other. He checked the key tag. It simply said, Jeep. <laughs> no license number, no indication which horse was his. It was hard to tell color in the dark, but one of the Jeeps looks as though it might have been green. He'd try that one first, the color of spring, the color of new beginnings. The door wasn't locked, and as Tatum pulled it open, he tried to remember if today was Tuesday or Wednesday. The man slumped across the front seat and didn't look as though he was going to tell Tatum any time soon. Tatum stood by the open door and looked up at the heavens. That's, that's what he liked about the West. There were still places where the world seemed enormous and full of promise. Um, Excuse me. Tatum had a momentary urge to shake the man awake, but the smell stopped him. It wasn't your usual rental car mix of air freshener and armor all. It was more a taste, bitter like copper with an unpleasant undercurrent that brought the airline sandwich back into focus. <laughs> you okay? There had been a CPR seminar that Tatum had had to attend as part of the company work, company's workplace safety program. He tried to remember the first three steps of CPR. The first had been to call out to check for responsiveness. He, he had done that twice. The second step, if he remembered correctly, was to tilt the head back and check for breathing. If the victim wasn't breathing, you were supposed to pinch the nose and blow into the mouth. Step three involved some sort of chest compression. He had never seen a dead body, and he wasn't sure he was looking at one now, but whatever the man's problems, Tatum didn't think CPR was going to help. <laughs> or more to the point, given the disagreeable odors that rolled out of the Jeep, step one was as far as he was willing to go. <laughs> Tatum closed the door softly, just in case the man was asleep and easily startled. Then he looked up at the bright stars and the cold sky one last time and trudged back to the terminal. So that's, that's the opening. <laughs> to be the first person in the room who gets to say, I'm a total fanimal. <laughs> <laughs> we were backstage and I said, I'm not antisocial, I'm actually asocial. And uh, <laughs> Thomas said, well, I'm antisocial. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's see how that goes for 45 of your precious minutes. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I have a list of questions, things that I want to ask, but I want to tell you as an asocial person that I have taken a dedicated stand this year that I say no to everything, but I said yes to this because in the world of indigenous literature, there were only three names when I was growing up that I knew. One was yours, of course, oh, Maria you. Campbell and Lee Miracle. And I know Lee and Maria, and this is my first opportunity to meet you, and I'm so thrilled. No. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you. I told you what I was going to ask you generally. But I forgot. <laughs> I love that part of it because <laughs> then I can just mix them up a bit. Um, I was going to ask because you have a body of work extending back, Wikipedia says, to the 80s. <laughs> 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 There's also a whole Whoa. photojournalist thing on there that I want to talk about. But before we get to that, I want to know how you got into mysteries. How did your body uh. of work lead you here? Why, as a literary fiction writer, would I go to mysteries? Yes, even it's smarter than I said it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a funny business. We, we, we like to divide things up into categories, and, and we feel that if we divide them up into categories, we understand them better. But quite frankly, I, I don't divide storytelling up into categories. So if I'm working as a... Uh, writing uh, books primarily for children, or if I'm doing nonfiction, or if I'm doing short stories, or if I'm doing genre mystery fiction, it's all the same to me. It's storytelling. And all I have is, uh, I, I understand that there are certain templates that you're expected to put over whatever genre you're working in, whatever category you're working in. And I, I, I try to follow those rules as much as I can, but quite frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm not a really good rule follower. So um, when it comes to mysteries, I, I don't see much difference between uh, a really good, well-written mystery 
and a piece of literary fiction, or a well-written mystery and a good piece of nonfiction, to be honest with you. They can all carry the same burden uh, one to another. I, I'm normally talking about issues that, uh, that affect native people, and so I can do that in a mystery as well as I can do it in a nonfiction book or in uh, literary fiction. It's just, in some cases, more concentrated, or the, 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 the aim may be a little bit different. But in Cold Skies, I'm talking about issues that, uh, that overtake uh, contemporary Aboriginal people, as I did in uh, uh, The Inconvenient Indian. So it's all the same to me. I just sort of, you know, it's just slightly different color, I suppose. And I like mysteries. I, I, I really do. I, mo mostly, I, I hate to say this, but I don't read much literary fiction. I don't read much nonfiction. I read really greasy, creepy <laughs> mystery. Some of it so badly written it would make your teeth fall out. <laughs> and, and some of it absolutely mesmerizing, just, uh, just beautiful writing. Uh, and I don't know why I do that. I mean, I guess it's for entertainment. Uh, uh, but it's hard to read a really good literary novelist if I'm doing literary novels. You know, it just, I want to steal. <laughs> <laughs> I see a phrase I like, and I just, yeah, yeah just bring it over here. <laughs> But the, the, uh, the, the, the mystery genre is always just, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. I don't take any less time writing them. I, 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 I uh, worry over my mysteries the same way I do anything else that I write, but uh, I do enjoy them. Now, mind you, if, if, you're, if you had followed my mysteries from the beginning with Dreadful Water Shows Up and the Red Power Murders, you'll know that the distance between the first two and this one is at least 10 years, 15 maybe. I'm not sure how long it was. And, there, and you might even ask me, why was that? What happened? Normally, mystery writers are supposed to uh, do a mystery a year. That's what's called commercial speed in the business. And I didn't do that. And so after I had let the mystery sag for 10 or 15 years, whatever it was. I don't want to think it's 15 years. Iris, was it 15? Iris, it might be. It might be, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Iris is my editor, publisher, she knows these things. So when I decided to do the third one, I went to Iris and said, hey, how about we republish the first two mysteries and then I'll write the third? And she said, how about you write the third, <laughs> fourth, and fifth? <laughs> so that I know you're committed to this enterprise, and then we'll publish the first two. And so that's, that's what happened. So the long and the short of it is, this is the third one, the fourth and the fifth are written, so that if I happen to drop dead, <laughs> you'll think I'm still alive, because somebody will say, and the new novel by Thomas King will say, didn't he die last month? As told to his writing partner, Tracy Lindbergh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I was um, driving my niece to a sport yesterday. Skipping's a sport, by the way. I didn't know that was a thing. But as I was driving her to it, she said, Mom says that, that this guy's writing mysteries, but she said he's a native writer. And I thought about it. I thought, how do you explain that she's a Canadian? She's not indigenous. I thought, how do you explain this to a Canadian kid that you're an indigenous writer, this is indigenous literature. And I said, and I want you to tell me if this is accurate or in your mind if this can be close to some truth. I said to her, I guess that the indigeneity in this book is a minor character. Mm -hmm. And it's a minor character, but it's an important one and it's in all three of them. Yeah. And that he takes great care to build that beautifully, but it's not the pressing voice. Would you yeah. think that's close to some truth? Well, I, I, certainly the depressing voice, uh, I, I, I have trouble, I have trouble with two things. Uh, a depressing voice, uh, even though I, I certainly fight depression in my own personal life, it's nothing that I bring into uh, the novels because those are safe places for me to work and so I'm happiest when I'm working. 
uh, on a novel, working with characters, and so it's, it's a world that I can inhabit. Um, the other thing, what was I going to say? You asked me about that question. So minor you know, character. Yeah, Is culture minor, a minor character. character. Yeah, it doesn't have to be. A, for me, uh, native material does not have to be a major character in a piece. Matter of fact, I, I think one of the mistakes that you can make is to feel so strongly about something that you use it as the raison d'etre for the novel itself and you wind up pounding people over the head with you know those concerns. Uh, I don't think people react very well to being told something over and over again. I, I think it's better if you can let them find their own way uh, to a particular conclusion. Uh, my attitude is you just sort of, you know, help them along, you know, uh, give them a couple of choices that they might be interested in, see what this road looks like. Uh, when I was younger, when I was younger, I, I was a, a pretty hardcore activist. Well, I was a, a chicken shit car, hardcore <laughs> activist. <laughs> I didn't like guns being pointed at me. I didn't take kindly to that. But uh, I would get on television and radio. This was down in the States now. And I would wave my fist and I'd have long hair with a bandana on it. And uh, I was pretty fierce. I mean, I was, I was, I've shrunk, but I used to be six foot six. <laughs> and I've lost quite a bit of weight. I used to be about 250 pounds. And so I was impressive, if I do say so myself. <laughs> And I could snarl with the best of them on television. And, uh, but what I discovered was that for all the snarling and all the shouting and all the waving of my fist, I was simply entertainment for, a basic, uh, for basically a white audience. And uh, that almost destroyed me to think that you know, I was sort of a circus act almost. And so I said, OK, I've got I to gotta stop that, and I've got to figure out some way to talk about these very serious issues. And what I discovered was that people were willing to listen to you if they thought you were friendly. And so I pretended to be friendly. <laughs> I'm gonna need a pen for this wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> and once you got them listening to you, once you got them laughing, and that's the important thing, get them chuckling, you know, we're buddies, we're just sharing a couple of things, then you can drop in a couple of little items here and there and uh, just let them sit. It's amazing how well that works. At least it worked a lot better than waving my fist and stomping my foot. And uh, uh, I've told this story a number of times, and if you've heard it, you have my apologies, but I don't like to throw good stories away. I was at uh, Chico State, and they had myself and a friend of mine, Richard Glazier Dan a uh, Mohawk, on a panel with two guys from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And we got up there and, you know, ranted and raved and stomped our feet, you know, the usual stuff. And uh, everybody clapped afterwards. And then the BIA guys got up there and they presented their pie charts and their graphs to show how things had improved for Native people uh, over, you know, the last 50 years or so. And when we were done and coming off the stage, the two BIA guys came off the stage first, and the person who had organized this shook each one of their hands and handed them an envelope, you know, the routine. And Richard and I came off the stage, and we got the handshake, but no envelope. And so I said to the woman, I held onto her hand, I figured I'd give it back after I got my envelope. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, uh, what was in the envelope you gave those guys? And she was embarrassed uh, to give her credit. She says, well, she says, uh, um, it was an honorarium. And I said, well, where's our honorarium? And she said, well, uh, after all, they're the experts. <laughs> and I said to myself, in my mind, what am I, the entertainment? And the answer was, yes, you were the entertainment. So uh, that really helped me as a writer really helped me as a writer. It, it demonstrated, in part, the way in which people listen. And it demonstrated the way in which people will, will take on a topic. And it's not with a lot of yelling, even though you want to yell, my God, uh, what's happened in uh, Native North America is enough to make you scream. 
but it doesn't get you very far. And that's the, tr that's the tragedy of the whole thing because you should be able to scream about it. But, and there are people who do, and I, I applaud them. Uh, but I don't do it anymore myself. I've got other ways that I think work just as well. Maybe they don't, maybe in the end I'm still entertainment, but I don't want to think about that. So don't tell me if I am. <laughs> I was thinking about it, um, having read all three of them back to back, that I had a real luxury to be able to do some comparative discussion and thinking. I also read them at the same time as my work wife, so we had some good arguments about it. Uh. But one of the things that I was thinking is that rather than pounding people over the head or yelling, what I sensed you were doing was perhaps developing an indigenous normative, whereby in some books you'll have people talking about the art of war and they'll give specific examples, or they want to talk about somebody who's warlike and they, they bring out uh, Winston Churchill. But the indigenous normative allows you to start conversations about Custer. Mm -hmm and have conversations that are normalized about the autonomy of indigenous peoples and the intellectual capacity of indigenous people that is normalized. Mm -hmm. And I think that I saw that in a number of places. In the, uh, in the last novel, the one you're selling now, Cold Skies, there were three instances where somebody was lip pointing. <laughs> <laughs> there was three instances where somebody was lip pointing and I thought if you're not actually familiar with indigenous groups yeah. or indigenous cultures, you don't know that that's how you'll point in a crowd. Where is he? He's over there. Yeah. Too far. <laughs> that's too far. Yeah, yeah. Where, <laughs> but, where are you going? <laughs> but you've, you've rendered that or made that normal. But in a way, some people are going to get it and some people aren't. Yeah. But there are pieces where you deliberately include, um, you're talking about an architect who designed a building and it's Douglas Cardinal. Yeah. So yeah. there's portions of you that are clearly sort of entertaining the indigenous normative of this is us, we yeah. build, so this is the architect that I talk about? Yeah, my, 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 my attitude has been that so, sometimes uh, early in my career, there was a request that I footnote some of the items that I put into my early novels, Medicine River, and I resisted that. Uh, because I didn't want to make it seem as though this was an exotic thing, that I wanted to make this seem perfectly normal. And if you didn't understand it, and you were concerned that you would look it up, or you would find out, you would ask somebody. But I didn't want to make it sort of a woo, you know? He's dealing with these, uh, you know, strange things that, uh, Nobody understands, and I wish I did. Uh, so I, I, I just assume everybody knows. It, I assume I'm talking to an Aboriginal audience. That, and, and sometimes, you know, my Aboriginal audience doesn't get some of the references either if they're historical, because the fact of the matter is, uh, uh, in many cases, we don't know our own history any better than non-natives do sometimes. That's a tragedy of the education system and the way in which our stories have been sort of cut off at the, at the knees. Uh, so for me to just simply make that a part of the landscape that I create is, is important. And uh, I, you know, I, I figured, I, I don't think anybody really has a, a tough time figuring out what's what. Uh, you know, if somebody's pointing their lips at somebody, you know, just figure, okay, that's just an idiosyncratic thing that people do. And we don't walk around going, mm. <laughs> Well, I don't. No. <laughs> and, and neither do I. But uh, I've got good friends on the Blackfoot Reserve, some of the old guys there, who, who do some of that. Or the, the best part, the thing I love most of all, is if you get into a conversation with uh, some of my buddies out in uh, Alberta, uh, you'll, be in a, you'll, you'll be talking. And it's polite if they sort of let you know that they're still awake and they'll make a mmm, mmm kind of sound. And people who haven't been on those conversations go, you know, what, what was that mmm, mmm? I was just, you know, it's just a polite kind of thing to say, yeah, I'm still awake, I'm still listening, you know. <laughs> you didn't lose me. And when you were as long-winded as I am, that's really important to hear every so often. <laughs> Sometimes I stop just to see. 
So I want to ask you specifically about uh, Thunk's Dreadful Water. Yep. First, where'd you get the name? Ah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then, because Thunk's, um, I'd like to know a little bit about him, and for people who haven't read the series, or for people who ha need a refresher, have. Um, he is now in a new phase of his career where he's doing photography. And I read on one of your bios that you used to be a photojournalist in Australia. Was this true? Yeah, I'm, I'm still a photographer, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's true. I was a photographer before I was a writer, long before. I, I went to uh, New Zealand on a tramp steamer out of San Francisco. I'd had it with, uh, with life in the U.S. And so I, I got a job on a tramp steamer, and I went to New Zealand. Uh, I thought it was New Guinea. <laughs> I, I did. I, I got on board the ship thinking I was going to New Guinea. I don't know why. And I had a map of New Guinea that I could look at, and <laughs> halfway across uh, the ocean, I discovered it was New Zealand. I thought, oh, damn, I don't have a map of New Zealand. <laughs> and I didn't. But uh, I got to New Zealand. I, it took a number of jobs when I first got there. I worked in a freezing plant. I worked as a deer color for the government down in uh, near Rotorua. Uh, all these jobs lasted about mm, two weeks. <laughs> and then I came back to Auckland and I got a job in a beer bottle sorting plant. Now I know as Canadians this looks like the perfect job. Because <laughs> you could, there was always beer left in some of the bottles. And you could just, and a lot of the guys did, I'm not kidding you. And so they'd have a little, nice little lunch repast and, uh, when we broke. And I didn't much like the job. Uh, sometimes you get broken beer bottles, you cut your hands, you stunk a beer the entire time. Uh, all the guys wanted to do was to watch sports. Uh, so I began casting about for another job and I saw an ad in the paper that was looking for a photographic assistant. And so when I'd left San Francisco, I had bought a camera. That's all I knew about photography, I had a camera and a couple of rolls of film. But I thought, well, this couldn't be that hard. So I went down to the place and I, I walked in and I said, I'm applying for the photographic assistance job. And the guy says, well, are you a photographer? And I said, I'm from San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> and he hired me. <laughs> and so I went back into the dark room that first day and the guy who was his assistant said, oh, thank God. I'm just swamped, I really need some help, so go over there and proof those negatives. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I stood in the middle of the room and he said, oh, he says, come on, he says, do you know anything about photography? I said, look, I said, I need the job I can learn. And he said, all right, here's the deal. You learn how to proof those negatives before lunch, otherwise you're fired. And so I did, and I learned photography half a day at a time. I did proofing the first part of the day. I did some thumbnail sketches the second part of the day, and he took me through photography half a day. And by the time I'd gotten to about the sixth month mark or so, I, I was an okay photographer. And so when they kicked me out of New Zealand, which is a completely different story, <laughs> it had to do with my visa. I went there on a 30-day visa, and, uh, and after a year, um, <laughs> The immigration department called me up and, uh, oh, because it's a good story, I'll tell it again. Um, this guy with a very British accent said, Mr. King, Mr. King. I said, yes. And he says, it's come to our attention that um, you have a tourist visa. And I said, yes, I do. And he says, and you've been here for almost a year. I said, yes, I have. He says, might I inquire when you're going to leave? And I said, well, I, I like it here. I wouldn't mind staying. And he said, well, is he, I don't think we can do that. And I said, well, how about this? How about if I apply for permanent citizenship, permanent residency, while I'm here in the country? And he said, I, I don't know if we can do that or not. He said, I'll have to check on it. He says, but in the meantime, I'll take some particulars. particulars. And uh, I said, sure. And he said, OK, you know, height, weight, color of hair, color of eyes, blah, blah, race, Indian. Long pause on the phone, he says, oh, he says, I'm sorry, we can't take an application from one of you blokes. I says, why not? I said, how many applications do you get from Indians of a year? And he says, oh, he says, thousands, thousands. And I said, where from, Arizona, Oklahoma? He says, no, no, Bombay, New Delhi. 
I said, no, 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 not those Indians, the North American Indians. And the guy, honest to God, said, what do you mean like cowboys and Indians? <laughs> and I said, that's the one. <laughs> well, as it turned out, I was not able to stay in the country and apply. I had to go back to the country of my origin. So I did have a uh, 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 permanent visa for Australia. And that had to do with a young woman I met when I was working as a uh, blackjack dealer in a coupier in South Shore Lake Tahoe. And I, that didn't work out, but I still had the visa and I had it with me in New Zealand. And so I went to Australia and there I, uh, I, I got a job as a photojournalist. I was able to go in there and say, you know, uh, I'm a photojournalist. Uh, well, let's see some of your photographs. And I could show them my photographs. And they could say, well, you know, have you done any writing? I said, yeah, but I don't have those, those sides anymore. And so they sent me off on a job uh, to cover surf boats off Bondi Beach in Australia. <laughs> and because I was Aboriginal and ex-Navy, they thought this was really great. <laughs> and so I did a story on surf boats on Bondi Beach, and they liked it. And so uh, they gave me a couple of other stories to do and then they hired me on and so I worked as a photojournalist for two years in Australia before I came back to North America. Mm -hmm. I noticed, uh, of course after I learned that I started rethinking it, but I noticed that within um, Cold Skies there's actually portions of the book dedicated to, and I'm not spoiling anything for you, um, people going through the way that they have different viewpoints when they look at pictures taken on a phone and how you can tell that somebody had looked at it or somebody had sent it who had not taken it, that you were engaged with that as a person who thought in terms of pictures? I, I do. Uh, a, a lot of times when I can't figure out my way in a, in a piece, I'm working on a book right now called Indians on Vacation. And there's a scene uh, in uh, Budapest and uh, my partner and I were in Budapest in Kaliti station at the very time that the, that refugee crisis had come to a head. We didn't know about it at all. We just, you know, we're going from Prague to Budapest on the train, got into Kaliti station and all of a sudden there was this huge refugee camp there and it was very, very sad and very kind of, it reminded me of, uh, <laughs> It might have been residential schools almost, to be honest with you. And uh, I'm trying to write about that right now. And so, and I didn't take any pictures. Uh, it would have been pretty, I couldn't have brought myself to do it, even if I was doing a story. I mean, you got little kids playing on the floor there, you know, they don't know where they're going to be going. Uh, they don't know when they're going to land someplace that they can call home again. Uh, they've left everything behind. It was just too sad to, uh, to take a photograph. So now I have to conjure that up in my head so I can see that scene. And I do that a lot when I'm, when I'm doing my uh, scenes in my books. I'll, I'll try to bring up that picture of how it should look or how I want it to look, at least take a snapshot. And we skipped Thumb's Dreadful Water. How did you come up with the name? Ah, uh, uh, Thumb's Dreadful Water. Well, it's pretty easy. Um, I never would have come up with Thumb's anybody. You know, what a terrible name to call the guy. But I'd sent away for a magazine, I forget, maybe it was a f photography magazine. And the woman on the phone uh, uh, spoke English as a second language and, uh, and I don't know if she misunderstood me or if in writing it down, she wrote it down wrong. But anyway, I said Thomas King. And when the magazine came, it was for Thumps King. <laughs> And all, all I can figure is that she didn't close the top of the O and that she used a capital A and dropped one of the legs down so it looked like a P. I, I, that's all I can imagine. <laughs> but there it was, Thumps King, and I still have the magazine, as a matter of fact. I'm not making this up. I couldn't make that kind of name up. And so I thought to myself, you know what, maybe I could use Thumps at some point in time. And then when I started writing the mysteries, I thought, you know what, oh, I'll use Thumps. And Dreadful Water is a big name in uh, the Cherokee Nation. And I've always loved it. I always wish I had a name like Dreadful Water. I mean, what do you do with a name like Thomas King? 
When I was a kid, it was Tom King or Tommy King. So it was Tom King, Ding Dong, King Kong kind of thing. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I got friends. Uh, one of my best friends is Leroy Little Bear. Now, that's a great name. And Martin Heavyhead. You know, these are good native Amethyst names. Amethyst First Rider. What's that? Amethyst First Rider. Amethyst First Rider. You know, it's just, yeah. Uh, and thus we end up with Deanna Heavy Runner. Yeah, yeah. I, I, at least I try to give some of my characters good, you know. But of course, there's a certain romance to that. Let's, let's face it, most of the Native people I know have names like Miller or King or... Uh, the Swedish Lindbergh. Or, or Swedish Lindbergh. <laughs> I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> I could see the trap I was walking into right there. I was going to say, Thomas King sounds pretty Indian from where I'm sitting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the good news is mo on most reserves, there's a king. There's a king family somewhere. I keep writing, whenever I get on to a reserve, people will say, are you related to the kings over there? And I, I, I want to say, yeah, yeah, there. But I don't know if they're horse thieves or not. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's a king. There, there are kings on the blood reserve. There are kings in, uh, in the Cherokee Nation. Uh, there are kings on the Mohawk. Uh, reserve. So it's, it's I, I think when Native people were forced to take Anglo names, they thought, well, King's pretty good. <laughs> That's not bad. That's sort of like money. <laughs> Thomas Money. <laughs> it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not as good as Thumps. It's <laughs> 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 a topper. I want to know because you wrote these over a period of time. Yeah. Um, how long has that character lived in you? Well, Thump, I mean, I know what you want me to say is that Thumps is more of me than, uh, <laughs> than made up. And it's probably true. Early on, I decided to give Thumps all of my ailments. So <laughs> what you can do is follow my medical history through, <laughs> through the books. And he's not doing well. <laughs> not doing well. Right now, he simply has diabetes, but just wait to see what I'm going to do to the poor boy. <laughs> uh, diabetes is a character in this book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if you live in the States and you're diabetic, man, I feel sorry for a lot of people down there because it, it's expensive. The stuff is expensive. You're on insulin. I'm on insulin. It's expensive down there. Uh, you know, it can, it can break you. Just, just the medical costs south of the border can break you. Uh, my brother and I were in South Carolina, I think it was, at a, at a 7-Eleven stop on our way. We were down there doing uh, portraits of Native artists and for a book that I thought I was going to get published at some point, but never happened. Um, yet. And we rent yet. And we, it'll happen when I'm dead. They'll say, oh! As inspired by Tracy Lindbergh. That's right, inspired <laughs> by Tracy Lindbergh. <laughs> and we met a guy who was complaining. He saw a Canadian license plates and he says, he says, you know, he says, we get tired of you people coming down and buying all our cheap drugs. <laughs> <laughs> he says, you come down by the bus load and buy our cheap drugs. And I said, you're out of your mind. I said, it's the busloads of Americans coming up to Canada to buy the cheap drugs. He said, no, I wouldn't give you two, two bits for that. We called him Two-Bit Jim. Uh, and, but, you know, I, I've got friends down in the States, uh, you know, who have to put up with those kind of medical costs. And it's, it's a killer. And uh, diabetes is not a cheap disease to have. It's not even uh, a glamorous disease to have. I've gotten to the point where I don't, before I used to shoot up in the bathroom. I'd eat a meal, I'd figure out how much insulin I needed, I'd go to the bathroom, I'd wait for everybody to leave or go into a stall, pull up my shirt, pinch that little thing of fat and give myself a shot. Now, I sit at the table. <laughs> my aunties call it hanging belly. <laughs> <laughs> I especially like to do it when there are kids in the restaurant. Too. <laughs> Watch this, kiddies. <laughs> Did that hurt, mister? Nah. So Thumps is a new diabetic. He's a new diabetic. He's 
a photographer now. Yep. He's of, I think, a mature age. He's mature as he's looking at his second, at least, career. Yeah. And he is somebody who sees the world visually and has a long-term relationship. Sort of long-term, off-and-on relationship with, uh, with, uh, with, with Claire Merchant. And everybody, everybody always wants me to marry off the hero and the heroine. When I did Medicine River, I have people who are still pissed off at me that I didn't marry the two of them off at the end of that particular book. And the same thing is happening with Thump Sinclair. I keep bringing them together and taking them apart. Well, that's the way life works a lot of the time. Just because you like people doesn't mean that you want to live with them or get married to them particularly. And those relationships sort of ebb and flow as you go along. Uh, and my brother keeps telling me that I've got to put more sex in my books, that, that <laughs> sex sells. And I tried that once. I think I tried it in the first or the second Dreadful Water book. I actually had Thumps take his pants off in that book. And by the time that happened, I was laughing so hard. <laughs> I, I just couldn't finish. And so I brought her teenage son into the scene, and he caught them, you know, sort of preparing to do things. <laughs> I, I can't handle that. I, 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 I'm not a prude at all. I just find it just hysterical. <laughs> it is the silliest thing I've ever seen. And how to describe that? You know, I just, other people can do it. Uh, I love the English, or I love the, when they talk about members. <laughs> Of Parliament? And I want to say Parliament, <laughs> yeah, that's my first, you know. We could, we could do a little association. I say member, you say Parliament. <laughs> the best part of this is we're not even off track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I, can't, I can't do that, and I don't do romance very well either. Uh, I always thought maybe I wanted to write for Harlequin because I hear you can make a lot of money on Harlequin <laughs> romances. I can't do romance. Ro romance makes me laugh too. Uh, it makes me itchy actually. Uh, <laughs> that might not be romance. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> what else do you? <laughs> I was going to say that the loveliness of Thumbs is also that I note there's sort of a fluency or a fluidity between urban and rural spaces, mm -hmm. and he can find beauty and awfulness in each of those places. And also, there's a, he has some fluidity between Canadian and American understandings himself. And I wonder how much of that reveals your experience as a person who lives cross-border and well, the, uh, the sad truth is that I, I really wanted to set Dreadful Water in Canada. And uh, my partner, who is a uh, Canadian nationalist, was really on me hard about setting the book in Canada. But, you know, we just don't have that many guns <laughs> that I needed for a mystery. <laughs> We really don't have the kind of body count that you need. And, and, and we don't have sheriffs, so far as I know. Now, maybe there are some sheriffs in Canada, but I, I don't know of any. And so, all in all, I had to move it just a little bit across the border. But I, I keep trying to make it more Canadian in its attitudes, uh, in terms of community, uh, uh, just in terms of the way in which people get along. Uh, one of my one of my favorite scenes. You remember uh, uh, Do Do South? Was that the one with the Mountie? Remember that? There was this great scene at the border at a bus stop, I guess it was, and they were all sitting in this little restaurant, and four of them, and they had all these plates in front of them that they had finished eating, and all of a sudden, while the characters are talking. Uh, the guy who plays the Mountie begins scraping and stacking the dishes. <laughs> and I thought, there is a quintessential Canadian moment. 
And so those kinds of things I try to bring into dreadful water so there is that kind of flow back and forth that you're talking about. So we got the American guns, but we have a kind of more uh, Canadian softness in terms of, you know, people don't yell at each other for the most part in the book. I don't like yelling. I thought Moses and Cooley were guys that I knew, that they were indigenous from this side of the border. Oh, the, yeah. They sort of boundary on traditionalism and also fantastic contemporary understandings yeah. of how to get the stuff done. Moses who has to get back so he doesn't miss the new episode of Say Yes to the Dress, right? <laughs> <laughs> and Moses is an elder. <laughs> yeah, Moses is an elder. <laughs> and he also keeps uh, on his land, the place that he lives, trailers that have been given up by corporations dropping them off and has a trailer filled with old computer parts that Claire's son operates and he calls them the nephews. The nephews, yeah. The nephews and I thought that was kind of brilliant because yeah. the reciprocal relations between <laughs> yeah, ancient I, and contemporary. I mean you can have a relationship with a computer. I have a relationship with mine. It's not very friendly but I have a relationship. <laughs> I also thought that the, there was this loveliness in that, in that relationship where people pick things up that look like community to them. When Moses is talking to Cooley about um, Thumps and is saying, make sure that uncle knows that, make sure that your uncle knows that. The elder is teaching him by virtue of saying yeah. in front of him, that's your uncle, he's a relative, you have to treat him in a certain way. Yeah, yeah. I think that helps bind community, uh, our communities together, as a matter of fact, that kind of... I mean, he's not, Thumps is not Cooley's uncle, okay? But, uh, but within that web of relationships, you, know, you, 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 you take on those kinds of roles. The older men or the older women take on roles uh, uh, like aunts and uncles for the, for the younger for the younger set, and I, I like that, I like that. Um, I remember I was, uh, I was, I guess it was on the Blood Reserve one time, and we were, uh, no, no, it was in, in Guelph. I used to sing on a big drum. Uh, most of the guys sort of disappeared, and the drum was around for about eight years or so. We had a good time, and we were at a, a, a powwow, a, a community gathering. And we had finished a couple of songs, and one of us, one, somebody always has to sit with a drum. You can't just say, okay, well that was the end of the song, and you know, we'll all go out and eat. You gotta have somebody who looks after the drum. And so it was my turn that time. And so I was sitting there, and this kid, about eight or nine years old, I guess, came up with a plate of food. And he says, here, uncle, you'll have some food. And I thought, wow, no one's ever called me that, except my own nephews and nieces. <laughs> but it was, it was quite nice. It, uh, I, I wasn't related to him. I didn't know him. Didn't know where he came from. But it was kind of that reaching out and saying, you know, you're part of this community. So, uh, You can feel that. I get sort of choked up on that, actually. <laughs> that was embarrassing. Sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is my last question before we entertain questions from the floor. Okay. There's reference in each book to the Obsidian Murders. Yes. Tell us where that's going to go and when people can expect to pick that work up. Okay, here was the deal. <laughs> when, I, when I didn't write the third book, and then I came back, hat in hand, and said, if you publish the first two, I'll write the third, my erstwhile publisher said, you started a mystery in the first book. When are you going to finish it? And I said, well, uh, probably, if I'm thinking right, about book five. And she says, can you do it in book four? And I said, I, I don't think so. I have to go with book five. And she says, then you've got to write all five books <laughs> before we kick this over again. And she was right. She was right. I'm not to be trusted as far as making deadlines. <laughs> especially in that instance. So, there were five books in the series, The Obsidian Murders, which is a serial killing that opens the first book, is in fact solved in the fifth book, and then we'll see what happens. Uh, there's, uh, there's a movement afoot 
to uh, turn Dreadful Order into a TV series. And, well, no, no, no. <laughs> yes, it's good money if it happens, and I'll, I'll be happy to see that, no, no doubt about it. But there's always the danger that if it really became a big hit, I could be the next Lucy Mob Montgomery. <laughs> Or poor Stephen King. I mean, <laughs> that redhead money is money in the bank. Yeah, I mean, St <laughs> Stephen's a wonderful writer. He got into the horror genre and can't get out. He's tried a couple of times, and the readers just pull him back down into the pit. Now, that's not going to happen to me. I know, I know, but it's just a bit of a worry at the back of my head. Success has its own problems. Let me tell you. Uh, of course, it's. <laughs> do I do I look like I'm unhappy? <laughs> I am not. I will tell you over my caramel latte for hours how hard success is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much.